10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the John DeVito Show. It is almost 12 o'clock Eastern time, and I'm taking a little bit of a lunch break today. Figured I'd do a quick show. So this was kind of a pop-up show. So welcome to everybody coming in. We get a lot of news going on right now. We got Tom Brady. People are talking about that. Mr. A, welcome to the show. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. So we're going to talk about Tom Brady. We're going to talk about the trucking convoy. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, uh, including Justin Trudeau and some other fun things. So sit back, relax, and enjoy, and I'll be back in a second. I got to hit my cough button, so hold on. Ah, good. So my boomer problems apparently have been worked out. Hey, crazy lady, welcome to the show. I found out that I have a faulty USB port apparently on my laptop. So, you know, what are you going to do? So hopefully everyone is doing well. We are uh, still digging out from the big snowstorm we had here in New England. And uh, we had a big one. You know, it wasn't awful where I live. I live out, uh, you know, probably an hour and 20 minutes outside of Boston. And along the coast uh, of Boston, they got, uh, you know, up to 30 inches of snow in some places. And I mean, that's a lot of snow. We're used to it up here. We get a lot of snow. But when you start talking about, you know, over two feet of snow, that's, that's when we start getting a little bit angry up here. <laughs> and we start to think about, uh, you know, ending winter and moving on to spring and all that good stuff. But today is a good day. Today's February 1st. So, you know, up here, at least that gives us a little bit of a glimmer of hope that maybe spring's on the way, that maybe we're going to be out at the beach sometime in the summer. And I always joke about, um, you know, winter and spring in New England. Lucifer, welcome to the show. So in spring, in, in winter here, you know, January is a long, dark month. And we finally start to get, um, you know, a little bit more light in the day. Like right now it's getting dark at about 5.15 in the afternoon during the early parts of January. I mean, we're getting dark at like 4.30 in the afternoon. I mean, the sun rises late. We're getting maybe seven hours of daylight and it really kind of beats you down. But as you get into, you know, the later part of February, you know, sunsets start happening closer to six o'clock and then we flip the clocks ahead in March, which is a good thing. But, you know, there's, there's, there's this, um, I guess, benchmark for the spring that I always consider when thinking about what springs in New England are like. And, you know, we've got the groundhog coming tomorrow, good old Punxsutawney Phil. And I know there's like 10 other groundhogs across the country. And I've got to say that Groundhog Day is probably one of the stupidest traditions we have in this country. And I'm sorry if I'm going to offend anybody out there. But I mean, the whole groundhog thing, you know, I, I don't even think I've ever seen a groundhog in person. And especially, you know, up there in Pennsylvania, you've got uh, Punxsutawney Phil and you've got that guy, you know, with the hat and wears his suit. And it's this big formal uh, party that they have up in that area of Pennsylvania. And for me, it looks like it's just a three day reason to get drunk and party, which is not a bad thing. But uh, the whole Groundhog Day thing, I mean, you know, again, we have six more weeks of winter, no matter what you say regarding the calendar. And then, of course, because of Groundhog Day, the day we have probably one of the most annoying movies in the history of movies, Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. I love Bill Murray, and that movie is just painful for me to watch. So anyway, so uh, up here in New England, we have a benchmark. Welcome, Code. Uh, welcome, everybody coming into the show. I greatly appreciate it. But up here in New England, you know, you, you get January, which just sucks. There's no way around it. It's cold. Uh, I think yesterday when I was driving my son up to the bus stop for school, it was minus seven degrees. Now, that's not with the wind chill. That's the temperature. It's just cold. You know, it's just cold. So January is long. It's dark. It's cold. It's windy. It's snowy. On and on and on. You get into February and you at least get that glimmer of hope where February is still going to suck weather-wise, but at least it's not January. And it's funny up here. You get into like March and April. And in March and April up here, people start to think, okay, here we are. We're in spring. No, 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 no. You're not in spring yet in New England until you get into like literally like May. Because up here in March, you know, everyone gets excited. March is just another February. It's one big, long, cold suck of a month up here in Massachusetts where it's cold. We get snow. We get ice. And that's when people start losing their minds. And I, I always try to tell people up here, you need to set your expectations. Because if you're expecting March to be a nice month, it just 
isn't. I mean, you may have a couple of nice days here and there, but it's not going to be nice. April, you start to see some glimmers of hope unless you get one of those Aprils where it literally rains every day of the entire month. And that does happen also. So, yeah, that's what we get up here. We, we live, you know, in uh, <laughs> kind of a rough climate, but it is what it is. So, but I'm looking forward to, you know, we're into February. Tomorrow's Groundhog Day. And actually, Groundhog Day was the day where I actually met my wife, believe it or not. So it was kind of funny. I went out uh, in February to watch Beanpot Hockey in Boston. They have a big uh, hockey tournament in Boston, uh, Beanpot Hockey, where the major colleges in Boston, you know, play this tournament at the uh, same place the Bruins play, the, the uh, you know, the Garden. And, you know, I'm not a big hockey fan. I got basically got dragged to this thing by a friend of mine that went to Boston University. So I ended up going, you know, to this Beanpot Hockey tournament. And that year it was on a Monday and I went out and ended up meeting my wife that day. So it was funny. Our first date was actually on Valentine's Day. And when we actually made the date, we didn't realize it was actually Valentine's Day. So, you know, we met on Groundhog Day, first date on Valentine's Day. I mean, what could you expect? 20 years later, we're married. We've got four kids. And uh, I'm guessing that there's probably a lot of days where she wishes she had stayed home and maybe did something else that night because otherwise, you know, she wouldn't have been trapped with me for the last 20 years. But uh, anyway, talking about sports, we're on the sports theme a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about this today since it's such a big story up here in New England. And people up here in New England are kind of angry about uh, TB12, Tom Brady. Tom Brady uh, finally announced his retirement officially again today. Uh, ESPN came out over the weekend and they said that Tom Brady had told some sources close to him that he was going to be retiring. I mean, you can't blame the guy. 22 years in the NFL uh, seven Super Bowl championships. He's been in 10 Super Bowls. I mean, he's obviously the greatest quarterback to ever play the game. I mean, what does he have left to prove? I mean, he's got, you know, probably between him and his wife, close to a billion dollars. I mean, they have everything they need. But uh, Tom Brady came out today and announced his retirement. He made a long post on Instagram where he talked about uh, his retirement from the game. He talked about uh, how thankful he was, you know, for the Tampa Bay Bucks. and mentioned a lot of things. Um, and a lot of different people. But the one organization that he left out in this entire thank you retirement notice was the New England Patriots. I mean, he didn't mention the Patriots. He didn't mention the Patriots fans. And quite frankly, I mean, I'm not terribly upset. I love Tom Brady. Now, I'm an old enough guy where I remember the New England Patriots where they were lit when they were literally like the Cincinnati Bengals or the Detroit Lions every year. When I was a kid, you could go to Patriots games and get 50-yard line seats the day of the game. And I was at actually one of the most memorable football games at the old uh, Schaefer Stadium back before we had Foxborough Stadium or Gillette Stadium. And when the uh, Patriots were in a big game and they actually called a guy out in a snowblower to blow a path for the field goal kicker, John Smith at the time. And it was like literally called the snowplow game. You can actually find it on YouTube. I was actually at that game as a kid with my dad, which is kind of funny. So Punisher, everybody, welcome in. This is a pop-up show today. I'm talking a little bit about uh, just the weather in New England so far, the big snowstorm we had over the weekend, talking about Tom Brady's retirement right now. And then I'm going to get into talking about the trucker convoy and also uh, Justin Trudeau and some of the other things that are going on. And even here in uh, Massachusetts, Governor Baker, who is our outgoing Republican governor, made kind of a big announcement this morning, and it was a little bit of a slap in the face to our mayor, Mayor Michelle Wu. So we'll get into that. But before I get into all that stuff, I want to talk a little bit more about Tom Brady. So Tom Brady retired. He did not mention the New England Patriots fans. He did not mention the New England Patriots organization. A lot of people are mad. I'm not mad. I love Tom Brady. He turned this franchise around as a kid watching the New England Patriots when they were literally the Detroit Lions. They were the worst team in the NFL every year. I never thought we would have a dynasty like we've had over the last 20 years in New England. So for me, I'm extremely grateful. I'm extremely fortunate I feel very lucky that we were able to have such a great quarterback with our team for all these years, and I will always be a Tom Brady fan. So, you know, maybe he got a little too big for himself over the last couple of years, but when you're being constantly called the greatest of all time and constantly, you know, told how wonderful you are and you've made money and you've won seven Super Bowls and, you know, you've married Giselle, I mean, life's been pretty good to you, you know. So I see Mr. A making the comment that he cheated. And, you know, I'd like to address that without kind of, you know, ragging on you with that because chances are there probably was cheating with the New England Patriots. I mean, I'm not going to lie. You've seen it in baseball with the Houston Astros. You've seen it with the Boston Red Sox. I played Division One football, you know, 25 years ago, so I'm an old man now. But I can tell you that at the school I played for 25 years ago, 
I would say that probably 90 to 95 percent of the players on my division one double a team were all on steroids that includes me I took them for a while also before my father caught me and almost killed me and I ended up quitting taking steroids but if you don't think for a second that every NFL team is doing the same thing that Tom Brady and the Patriots were doing. Now, there was an express rule in the NFL rules about preparing the footballs. The NFL team would give the referee their own footballs, and then they would give them back to each team to allow the team to, quote unquote, prepare the footballs. I mean, what do you think it meant for them to prepare the football? Tom Brady liked his a little bit deflated. You know, Aaron Rodgers liked his a little bit more pumped up. The NFL was allowing the quarterbacks to prepare the ball the way they wanted to and then all of a sudden it became a big scandal when you had the patriots now when it comes to stealing signs do you think the new england patriots were the only team that were stealing signs i mean there's a reason why coaching staffs send out football coaches to other teams games they're looking to steal signs they're looking to catch plays they're looking at films to try to catch all these type of things this is a commonplace thing in football and it's also very commonplace in baseball. Now, as we're talking about sports, I'm going to make this segue over. If you recently saw the uh, MLB and the National Baseball Hall of Fame, they admitted David Ortiz into the Hall of Fame. And I'm thrilled. I'm a huge Big Poppy fan. I love David Ortiz. He is probably the greatest baseball player we've ever had in Boston. I mean, we've had Ted Williams and we had Babe Ruth. But, I mean, Ted Williams didn't win championships like Big Poppy did. He didn't hit in big games like Big Poppy did. I mean, Big Poppy was amazing. And that man is literally a legend in this city. That man would never have to buy a beer, never have to buy a dinner in Boston. He is a beloved person in this particular place. But now, when you look at the decisions that the Hall of Fame made, they didn't put Roger Clemens in the Hall of Fame. Barry Bonds is not in the Hall of Fame. You look at uh, Kurt Schilling is not in the Hall of Fame, even though his regular season record is more borderline. The reason why those players are not in the Hall of Fame is because they played during the steroid era. Now, it was reported also that David Ortiz took steroids during his career. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, I played football on a $50,000 four-year scholarship. I took steroids for that. And the majority of my team was taking steroids to get a full academic scholarship to college. If you don't think the majority of these professional football players, professional baseball players, professional hockey players, professional basketball players, if you don't think the majority of those players are not cheating and taking performance enhancing drugs, of course they are. Look at Tom Brady. Tom Brady is almost 45 years old. He looks like he's 25, had an MVP season. There's a reason. I mean, it's not just TB12 in his diet. And if you look back on Bonds and Clemens and those guys that are not in the Baseball Hall of Fame, they played in a steroid era. Now, why was there a steroid era? Jose Canseco was the one that blew the lid off of the steroid era, right? He's, he told everybody that the entire Major League Baseball is taking steroids. And everyone laughed at him. You know, he's a clown, whatever else. But the steroid era happened right after baseball had had a long strike where a lot of fans had turned away from the game. They, were, they didn't watch baseball. Fans weren't coming out to the games. So Major League Baseball needed to do something in order to, prevent, to, to get people back interested in baseball. So number one, they talked about how they made livelier baseballs. The baseballs were flying out of the stadium. But I don't know if they encouraged players to take steroids, but I think that they certainly looked the other way. I mean, there had to be some question as to whether or not guys like Mark McGuire, Jose Canseco, Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens were taking steroids, and baseball did nothing to stop it. So once this whole thing blew up and you got, had guys like McGuire hitting 70 home runs, Barry Bonds breaking the home run you know, record, then when you're looking at that in the rearview mirror, then baseball comes back and says, well, they were all taking steroids. You know, they cheated, whatever. But baseball allowed the cheating. Baseball wanted the cheating because – the cheating and the steroids and the home runs actually saved the game of baseball. So, you know, cheating, did Tom Brady cheat? Probably. He probably did. But don't think for a second that Peyton Manning didn't cheat. We hear a lot about him. Do you remember when Peyton Manning was coming back from the neck injury and Peyton Manning was having performance-enhancing drugs sent to his wife in her name? But, of course, you know, when he came out and said, well, those were for my wife, they weren't for me, everybody bought that. I mean, come on. Do you really think Peyton Manning's wife was getting performance-enhancing drugs? Or do you think maybe, just maybe, Peyton you know, was trying to get some drugs so he could heal from his neck injury and come back to the NFL. So uh, I agree. Tom Brady probably cheated, but still, that does not take away from me that he is the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. 
And I feel very fortunate that I was able to watch him play his career. So that's all I have about sports. I know not everybody's a sports fan, but I wanted to talk about that since it's such a big sports story. Now, I wanted to go into a few other things and talk about uh, a couple other things happening in the country. Now, I want to ask the people who are in here. And Eric, if you want to call in, I see that you're in there. I didn't notice you would come in. Just call in. You can co-host with me. Uh, this was a pop-up show, no interviews today. But, uh, you know, what do you all think about the truck convoy? Now, I know this has been happening for a while, but I wanted to talk about this a little bit today because, to me, this is such a huge moment in American history, in Canadian history, when you see these truck drivers, when you're seeing 150,000 trucks heading to Ottawa, heading to the capital of Canada, you see 1.5 million Canadian citizens walking there and protesting against the mandates, against the COVID-19 mask mandates, the vaccine mandates. People want their freedom back. I hear word that there's going to be a similar convoy now happening in Washington, D.C. I mean, to me, this is exciting. This is finally we are seeing the things that we've all hoped for may be finally coming true where we are all uniting. I mean, think of how many times we've talked on this show about needing to unite as one. I think we're finally starting to see the Canadian people. We're seeing the, United, the people in the United States start to unite. The narrative from the woke crowd is falling apart. The COVID narrative is falling apart, and we're seeing not just Republicans and conservatives, but we're seeing Democrats, and we're seeing people on the other side who are now stepping up and saying, wow, this is bigger than political party. This is about freedom. This is about a government that's trying to take away our freedom and take away our rights. And I hope, and I mean this, I sincerely hope that everything remains peaceful. I don't want to see anyone get hurt. I don't want to see violence. That's not something I would ever advocate, but I do think it's very important and it's very telling that finally we are seeing the people in Canada speak up and we are starting to see the United people in the United States speak up. So I think for all of us, you know, this is not a time for all of us to sit back now and, you know, just declare victory over this because the people on the left and the people that want to control us are not going to give up. They're not going to roll over. They're not going to give up. They're, they're just going to change strategies. And that's what people like them do. I mean, they may pull back on the COVID stuff because they're going to have to, but they're going to regroup and they're going to come at us from another direction. And I think as citizens of Canada, citizens of America, citizens of the UK, Scotland, Australia, wherever you are, we need to start pulling together and letting these officials know that this is our country. These are our countries. This is our world. They are in the minimum. We are the numbers. And I think if we can demonstrate to them that we, in fact, have the power and they need to be reminded that they are here to represent us, that's going to be a good thing for all of us. And for me, when I look at Canada and when I look at hap what's happening with Justin Trudeau, now I want to see a show of hands in here, and I, I have a feeling it's going to be very, very short. But who thinks that Justin Trudeau actually has COVID right now? Come on. Justin Trudeau is a coward. He is like Joe Biden. Justin Trudeau is hiding out reportedly in the United States, and now he's declared that he has COVID. He, ha he came out in a long tweet. I'm not sure if everybody saw this, but he was calling again the truckers and the people marching on Ottawa racist and all these different things. I don't know about all of you, but I am tired of hearing the racist narrative. We hear it all the time here in Boston when people were coming out against Michelle Wu saying that we didn't believe in vaccine ID mandates and we didn't believe in government overreach into our lives. She came out and called everybody in Boston racist. And I'm sure all of you have heard that Boston is a terribly racist place to go. I disagree. I've grown up here my entire life. And, you know, there's racism everywhere. There's racism, white people against black people, you know, people against Hispanic people, people against white people. You know, there's racism everywhere, and there always will be racist, racism. But I think it cheapens racism 
when you have politicians that are using that in order to get a desired response. And that's what you get with Justin Trudeau calling people racist, Michelle Wu calling people racist. We're not racist. We just disagree with you. We're not saying, I mean, I don't care if Michelle Wu is Asian, Hispanic, white, black. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me if she's a competent government official and she is doing what's best for her people, then congratulations. You deserve the position that you have. But when you look for someone that is obviously pushing like a woke narrative, someone that is pushing to control us and take away our freedom, this has nothing to do with racism. This has to do with people sticking up for their fundamental rights. Now, if you really think about what the founding fathers planned for this country, now we're talking about the U.S., the founding fathers were not out of touch. They're not outdated. You know, the calendar may have said, you know, a few hundred years ago, but these were very intelligent men, men that would be relevant in today's society and quite frankly would probably be very disappointed as to what we've become. But these founding fathers of our country lived with tyranny. They lived with government control. They knew what it was about and they fought against it. Many gave their lives so we could have freedom. And these founding fathers created a document, the Constitution, which basically gave us the template. They gave us the 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 you know the the plan that we needed in order to protect our freedom and one of the things that we have seen is that the government is getting away from everything in the constitution they're trampling on our rights and these things have been extended across the entire world so you know getting back to Justin Trudeau the man doesn't have covid he's faking he's hiding he's li- he's hiding he's lying he again is pushing the the racism narrative. The man doesn't have a leg to stand on. Joe Biden is in the same circumstance here. I mean, if you look at his poll numbers now, the man has lost all levels of approval. The Democrats that have voted him aren't happy that he's here. And he is going down the same road that Trudeau's going. So for all of you that are here in here, if there's anybody new, could you please like my show? Hit the like button. Please share my live if you could to help get the word out there a little bit. I'd really appreciate that. And uh, if you could, if you have any questions, feel free to put those down in the chat. So uh, regarding the truck convoy, Eric, I'd like to hear your impression on this. But regarding the truck convoy, personally, I think that this is one of the greatest things I've ever seen in this country where we are seeing these truckers pull together. I mean, they are really the lifeblood of this country and of Canada, because if we don't have truckers that are transporting goods, we don't have food. We don't have goods. We don't survive. And they are letting the government know that they are standing by the people and they are standing up against the mandate. So, Eric, do you think, I I see you're on mute mute there, so take yourself off mute. Do you think we're going to have a similar truck convoy here in the United States, or is this going to be just something that happens only in Canada? Well, I'm... I would imagine if if, if, the, if Trump. I think we lost you a little bit. You remuted there. You okay? If you're in a bad place, I can just talk. You know, I don't mind doing that. I can go on endlessly. It looks like you remuted. You need to a second to get yourself back to a good place. Not to be in a bad area. But me personally, I think I think it's amazing. I think what what's happening in Canada is great, and I think for all of us, you know, the American people, for the people that are out there doing their thing, we all need to st- continue to stand up for our freedom. Because if we continue to put the masks on, if we continue to bow to the government telling us how to live our lives, then we are gonna not we're, we're gonna have no freedom left in no time. So, Eric, I see that you're back. Why don't you go ahead and tell us what you think about the uh, uh, the truck convoy? Is well, it going to happen in the U.S.? Um, I, I, I apologize. I was interrupted by a phone call. Um, okay. Don't worry about it. It's okay. But um, if, if truckers in Canada are doing it, I mean, I would imagine truckers here in the States might wind up doing it and, and elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of protests. I mean, there was, a, there was a big protest. I'm not sure if everybody saw it. But there was a big protest in D.C. a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday where we had a lot of people that came out. I mean, there were people that came out to protest the mandates. And really... You know, this isn't even just about the freedom. I mean, the freedom is the most important part. But if you're looking at the data and if you're looking at everything that's being reported right now, even the CDC, the World Health Organization, you get all these different groups that are out and telling us that basically what we have is a glorified flu. And one of the big things that happened here in Massachusetts, and this was an absolute slap in the face to our new communist mayor, our dictator in charge, Michelle Wu, but they... The governor came out and said that basically it's time for the colleges and the schools and the people to roll back the mandates because we are now entering an endemic 
thank you so and much. And this is no longer a pandemic. I didn't know what an endemic was, but apparently an endemic is just something that is the next stage down from, from a pandemic, and it's something that's manageable. It's a virus that's very contagious, but not something that's as life-threatening as a pandemic. And I think, I think it's time. I mean, I, I don't know how why this has happened for so long. I mean, I, I think about this a lot, and I try to think, you know, is this something that has been done on purpose, which I do believe, or is this something where fear has just gotten out of hand with people, and they have just continued these mandates, and, they, and they're afraid to go back to life as normal, because I do think there's a lot of people that are terrified right now, and I have run into some of those people that are very, very scared still, but I mean, I think a lot of that fear has been driven by the media and has been driven by the politicians. So, Eric, do you think we're at the end of this? Do you think we're going to see these mandates finally start to roll back and hopefully become permanent? I would hope so, for, you know, for us to get back on the right track. Let's see, I see that someone said there was a message that came through e-logs to truckers in America that drivers would be charged with a felony if they stopped their trucks on any highway. Oh, my God. Now, I did not see that. If you get a chance, please send that to me on social media, whatever. Hey, slightly serious. Welcome to the show, brother. Good to hey, see sorry, you. Hey, I hope you're feeling better, buddy. Yeah, how's he now? How is slightly feeling? I know that he's been having some health issues. I mean, he said he is about not ninety percent better from his COVID dilemma. Um, I haven't heard anything new on Spanky from Beans and Weenies, but hopefully, he's starting to get better and better. And Spanky provides us an update. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but our other pod being friend, Too Much Saucy, is in the hospital, and she's oh. due to have surgery on thursday now, let me let me ask you because about that I, too, much, too much saucy called into my show the other day and she mentioned that she mm -hmm. has some health hey, issues what, what what is what exactly is she battling hey dean joe what is too much saucy actually battling battling for health issues and is she in the um, hospital for covid right now is that what it is or she 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 does not have covid thankfully um what it's my understanding that doctors are going to be having to remove a rod from her leg on thursday because Ooh. i think it got infected but but they're trying to prevent her from catching a sepsis infection. Oh my goodness, the poor thing! So please, that's please definitely keep her in your thoughts and prayers. Absolutely, you know, and hopefully she might surprise us. Yeah, you know, it's, sc it's scary when you start having things like that happen. Like you know, my daughter Caitlin Dina Joe is you know close with her. She was in the hospital last mm -hmm. week, and Caitlin uh, had COVID, and she ended up starting starting to get tach tachycardic. I think it's called. It had to do with her heart race, heartbeat racing. So Caitlin was in the hospital okay. for a couple of days. And the funny thing in my house is now, as, as you've all known, I've been very clear about this. You know, I support 100% that people choose to get vaccinated, vaccinated. It's not something that you need to be told to do. But I'm fully vaccinated. I was boosted. My wife is fully vaccinated. She was boosted. My son, Matt, and my daughter, Caitlin, same thing, fully vaccinated and boosted. But then when it came to my youngest two, Ethan and Brandon, my wife and I talked about it, and we both decided to hold back on the booster for them because we were concerned about some of the side effects that were being reported yeah. with the booster shots. So Ethan and Brandon have not been boosted as of yet, but now Caitlin is one that was fully vaccinated and boosted, and she ended up in the hospital with COVID and uh, you know was struggling with her heart and everything. It was really scary, but thankfully she's home, and she's doing better now and all that good stuff. So, yeah, scary stuff, Dina Joe. It really was. I mean, Caitlin is a sweetheart, and – you know, she's had a lot to deal with over the years, and we were really proud of her that she was able to fight through that. But she spent a couple of days in the hospital. It was very, very scary. So, but slightly, I'm glad to hear you you're doing better. And uh, so, how about you know, how about some of the other? I mean, have we had other people here on Podbean that have been struggling with COVID and other um, issues? Because it seems like there have been a lot of people lately, in addition to slightly and too much sauce, that have been dealing with health issues. Who else? And, and beans and weenie also. Well, Michael Key, um, who's going live at the top of the hour, um, he he's got a very mild case of COVID. It sounds like, but um, but but otherwise, you know, you know, he's in good spirits. Um, well, it's, it's good to hear. I mean, you know, it seems like most of the cases have been fairly mild. It seems. And he's you know, vaccinated. Like, yeah. My, my, my son, Brandon, Brandon got it. He, he was vaccinated. He had it fairly bad. He missed five days of school. And my it was funny. My son, Ethan, I think was my more sick than Marley the other two, but he didn't have COVID. So Ethan had something that was worse and he didn't have COVID. We tested him literally three times during the week because my wife has access to tests, and he didn't have it. So two of my kids had it. So right now, if you really go back upon time, Ethan is the only one of my kids that has never had COVID. Matt had it. He was asymptomatic. Um, you know, Caitlin had it fairly seriously. And then uh, Brandon had it also. But Ethan has not had it. So, I mean, how can you 
how can you have four kids in one house and they're you know with each other all the time and have one of them that doesn't have COVID? But hey, slightly, let me ask you this question. You're in there. I hope you're still here. I, I, I see that you're still one of my listeners. Um, have you changed your viewpoint? You had COVID. You've been sick. Do you feel that the mandates should be happening? Has your viewpoint changed at all? Or do you still feel the same way you have now that you've had kind of a more personal experience with COVID? Because I've talked to a bunch of different people. I've had some friends that have had it. Some have you know, said it was nothing more than another. I don't know flu. if Big Sexy called it or not. Yeah, other people, other people have said it was very serious and very scary. I know Jeremy Cummings had it. And, uh, you know, so he said, I still wouldn't have gotten shot. You should still have a choice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's one of the things that is the foundation of our country. And I mean, I grew up in the state of New Hampshire. And for those of you that aren't that familiar with New Hampshire, New Hampshire is the complete polar opposite of Massachusetts. Massachusetts is like little California and New Hampshire is like little Texas. I mean, the state motto is live free or die. When I grew up, in New Hampshire, there's no seatbelt law. I still don't think there is one. There's no motorcycle helmet law. You know, back in the day, you could literally walk into the police department, fill out a piece of paper, and have your concealed to carry <laughs> license that day. I imagine that's probably changed. But New Hampshire people keep their you know free rides very, very close to them. So for me to move from uh, New Hampshire into Massachusetts has been kind of an adjustment, you know, to try to get used to it. It just gets me how you know not just about how much the government sometimes wants to control people, but also about how some people seem to really want to be controlled. And that's something we're seeing in Boston right now, where it's just been crazy, where you've got the mayor who is, you know, taking away people's rights. And the governor finally came out and spoke out against her today. But I mean, people are just supporting her, you know, preach on, keep the mandates coming. I mean, there was talk that restaurants are losing $15,000 a week in revenue. I mean, these restaurants can't afford that after we've what we've had for the last three years. And I, and I get that people are afraid of getting COVID and people are afraid of getting sick. But I mean, when you look at a small restaurant in the city of Boston, I mean, number one, it's very expensive rent. You, know, you have to put a lot of money into starting a business like that. Maybe people have used all their savings. Maybe people have used inheritances. Maybe people have taken second and third mortgages out in their homes to start these businesses. And then you have the, the government say, okay, well, nobody can come into the city unless you have a COVID ID mandate card. And it makes no sense where right now, you know, the vaccinations are not stopping people from getting COVID. And, you know, you in, in the city of Boston, maybe someone can explain this to me. You cannot go into a restaurant without a COVID card. You cannot go into a gym without a COVID card. However, if I want to go to a grocery store or if I want to go to market, if I want to go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's or a Walmart or a Target, I don't need a vaccine ID card there. And I thought one of the funniest things I saw in Boston was, and I told this story a couple of days ago, but I'll say it again for the people that are in here now. There's a mall in Boston. I think it's called the Corner Mall. I've never heard of it before. It's, it's some small mall. And they literally have a sign on the outside door of the mall that says you can come in and shop. So the people of Boston and the surrounding areas can come into this mall. They can go into the stores. They can you know, get their steps in by walking around the mall if they want to spend three hours in there. But if they go to the food court and they want to get a slice of pizza, they have to show their vaccine ID card. I mean, how does that make any sense where well, you could shop in the stores, you can hand them your credit card, hand them your cash, you can buy things, you can talk to people, you can probably pull your mask down to talk. But then, you know, when you decide, you know, I'm kind of hungry, let me go get a slice of pizza, then you have to pull out your vaccine ID card. So to, to me, it just makes no sense. So I see slightly saying, I don't understand the race of everyone going to get tests. Honestly, if you've got it, you've got it. Thank you. You know, my wife and I just had the conversation today. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. This is kind of funny. Actually, you guys will laugh about this. Eric, you'll like this story. So, you know, as I told you all, this is kind uh -huh. of going in a little bit of a different direction, but it'll loop back to the testing. So as many of you know, you know, I played football for many years, had several concussions, and my wife and I have had the conversation, you know, do I have CTE? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. You can't test until you're dead. And I certainly had several concussions. Well, the other night, <laughs> my daughter and I bought like a new uh, entertainment stand for our television in our living room, and we bought it off Facebook. Got a great deal. Got 50 bucks for this nice uh, entertainment station with two side tables, and it replaced the ones my kids had destroyed in the family room. So they were really nice, kind of like a farmhouse door on the front, really pretty. So my daughter and I went and picked them up. We loaded them in the back of my Ford Expedition. I have an SUV. And we get home, and I had to bring in the side table first. So I had to open up the back uh, door of my truck. 
So I bring in the side tables, I brought in a few other things, and then we have this automatic light that goes on outside of my garage. You know, when there's motion, it turns on a motion activated light. So I went back out to get the final thing out of the trunk. And I had forgotten that I had left the uh, back of my SUV open. The light did not turn on and I'm tall. I'm six foot four. So I literally hit my forehead right on the edge of the door. Oh my God. I saw stars. I almost knocked myself out. I drew blood. I was bleeding on my face. So my daughter had to put like a bandaid on my forehead. And then we were going someplace afterwards. So I literally had blood through the bandaid on my forehead when I went to a basketball game to watch my son play. But my daughter right away said, you know, you need to be careful. You may have gotten a concussion. And I'm like, I don't think so. I've gotten them before. I'm fine. So I have had headache for, headaches for the last two days. I slept like 20 hours the last two days. I was in bed last night at 8 o'clock Eastern time, which I don't ever go to bed that early. And my daughter kept saying, I think you have a concussion, Dad. So I was telling my wife this morning, and she goes right away, she goes, well, it's either a concussion or maybe you have COVID. Let's get you a test. Literally, I have probably been tested 20 times, and that is not an exaggeration. When I've done the movies with my son, Matt, I get COVID tests three times for each movie. You have to do it like a week before, a day before, and then the morning of you're on set, you have to take a rapid test. So I literally, and this may even be conservative, I've gotten 20 tests. So I said to my wife this morning when she said that, you know, maybe you have COVID. I'm like, well, if I have COVID, I'm not even sick. So there's no point in me getting a test. And slightly, you're completely right. People, I mean, people here in Boston, it was minus seven degrees out a couple of weeks ago. And we had lines that were four hours long of people standing out in the cold, standing side by side with some people that probably had COVID. And then they were going in. Now, this was the best part. They couldn't do the COVID test indoors, okay, because of COVID. But then the mayor, our wonderful mayor in Boston, <laughs> put up tents. So she put up these tents that basically had walls. And I don't know how they were any different from actually being indoors. So she was giving the COVID tests. So people were standing in line for four hours to find out if they were sick. I mean, Good God, is this where we've come to in America, Jess Duck, right? Is it just me? I look at these people and I think, why the hell are you staying and standing in line for four hours? If you don't feel sick, go home. If you're sick, then do what we did in the old days. Take a few days off from work, take some medicine, stay in bed, and then in a few days you're gonna feel better. I mean, for how do we have we gotten to this place in society where these people are literally standing outside in line? for four hours, freezing to death. And again, right, like you said, you slightly, I mean, <laughs> I may not have it, but the person I'm talking to in line next to me might have it. So I'm standing in line to get a COVID test. Who knows? But by, by the time I get to the front of the line, I might actually have COVID. I mean, it's just, it makes no sense. And I mean, if you look at like walking into a restaurant, you can walk into a restaurant, you have to have your mask on, but then when you sit down, you have to take it off. In Massachusetts right now, they're forcing all of the, the students to wear masks all day in school. They're all down below their noses. They're all down below their mouths. The kids are playing basketball. They're forced to wear masks on the basketball court, even though none of them are wearing them properly. And the MIAA in Massachusetts just finally came out now. They did not remove the mask mandate. So basketball players have to wear masks on the court. Now think how hard it would be to run up and down the court with a mask on. But now after the games, they can shake hands with the other players. So you can shake hands with the other players. You can bump into them the whole game and have all kinds of contact with them. And you still have to wear a mask. I mean, I just don't understand how any of this stuff makes sense. But so many people are just willing to take it. And so many people are willing to sit back and <laughs> not question anything. And it makes you see how things like the Holocaust happen. Now, I'm not comparing COVID to the Holocaust. So for the people out there that hear this on download, I'm not an idiot. I know there's a difference. But when you look at how the, how the Holocaust happened, right, how did they get to that point? How did they convince the very well-educated population in Germany and in surrounding areas to do what they did in those times. I mean, these were well-educated people. These were, you know, this was a first world country and they were convinced that this was the way to go. And, you know, I know Joe Rogan's taking a lot of heat right now on Spotify, which I think is hysterical. I mean, Neil Young, who the fuck thought Neil Young was even still alive? I mean, Neil Young is like 98 years old, and someone needs to tell him that his last fan, Betty White, died two weeks ago. I mean, I, Neil Young, you're going to pull your music off of Spotify? Oh, well. And I, I think it's funny that one of Neil Young's favorite songs, isn't it like 
Rocking Free in the USA or whatever the hell the name of his song was. I mean, it was so long ago, I can't remember. But I mean, Joni Mitchell, Neil Young. I mean, I'm fucking old. And these people mean nothing to me. I mean, honestly, the only people that would like like Neil Young at this point would be like my father, who's like, you know, 80 years old. I mean, who the hell, who the hell cares if you're going to pull your music off of Spotify? I'm sure the executives at Spotify, this was tough for them. You, know, you, can, you can see the email come through like the CEO of Spotify's desk. All right, we get a tough decision to make. Uh, we got Neil Young, who gets like seven downloads a month for his songs. And then we've got Joe Rogan, who pulls in 40 million v- listeners a month. Jeez, who should we cut? Should we cut Neil or should we cut Joe? Neil, Joe, Neil, Joe. You know what, Neil? Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I don't understand. It's it's just so stupid. But now I, I've got to say I'm disappointed. Spotify has decided now they're going to put a warning on all of the shows that talk about COVID. I mean, for Christ's sakes, can't you let the American people make up their own minds? I do believe, you know, I did a whole show on mass formation psychosis. I do believe that's a thing. I do believe it's legitimate. I do believe that that's been happening. And I do believe that that is how in Germany they were able to get so many people to follow the Nazi party and actually in the lives of so many people during the Holocaust. Well, for me, this whole thing has been more than about wearing a mask. It's been more than about, you know, don't be selfish. You know, you, you need to think of other people, you know, for me and for all of you, hopefully freedom is not selfish. Having the right to choose over what you do with your body is not selfish. And, and I will tell all of you, I know Eric will disagree with me on this, but for me, you know, I'm a Republican and I am one that never takes a hard line on abortion. Now, I know that, you know, Jeremy Cummings would disagree. He's a Christian. And for me, I don't agree with abortion. And the reasons why, and hang with me because I'm going to tell you my full feelings, but then tell you why I don't fight, fight on abortion. For me, I do think that once there's a heartbeat in a baby, that's a life. And that is my internal feeling. I feel that once there's a heartbeat, once that baby is alive inside the mother, then you're not just talking about just the mother anymore. You're talking about another life. Very similar to not being able to pull the plug on someone that's 97 years old and is living in a vegetative state and ending their lives or giving someone pills when they don't want to live anymore. You know, that's considered murder. And, you know, abortion is one of those things where, You know, I do believe in pro-choice, but in my opinion, the choice happens when the penis enters the vagina. When the penis enters the vagina, I love saying that, penis, vagina, vagina, penis. You know, it just seems, I don't know, I'm I'm fucking 10 years old mentally. But anyway, when the penis enters the vagina, then the choice has been made, right? And if you get pregnant, despite taking the pill, despite using condoms, you've made a choice knowing that potentially get, you know, you could get pregnant from that act. Now, for me, I do see the full picture and I do see women's perspective on this. I mean, I'm not a woman. Um, I'm a he, him. I'm not a she, her. So I'm still working on my pronouns, but he, him, they, there. I don't get how a person could be a they. That's another thing I just don't understand. So we'll have to explain that to me. But anyway, so, you know, for, for me, lo- looking at a woman, I mean, a woman, it is her body and you are pregnant and if by chance your life is in danger or if by chance you've been raped and you did not have the choice to have sex, who am I to tell you that you should not have the ability to end a pregnancy if it, if it puts you in danger or if you didn't have the choice? I mean, it doesn't change the fact that, in my opinion, a beating heart is still a live person. And it's such a difficult, difficult thing to talk about. So for me, I think about abortion quite a bit and I do feel that as a man i really don't have the right to tell a woman to do with it with her body with what she feels that she needs to do so that's just kind of how i think about it but i do feel also that it has to be the same way when it comes to the covid vaccine if you believe in my body my choice and you believe that a woman should have domain over her body then why don't the rest of us all have domain over our body and you know i've made this very clear on my twitter page and in other places that I personally will not spend one dime in any business or any city that currently has a vaccine ID mandate card, a requirement. And I have one. I could go into Boston tonight, get reservations in the North End, beautiful Italian restaurant, have my COVID card, have a wonderful meal with my wife. But I'm not going to do it because I don't believe in the government pushing segregation. And it's funny how the government, you know, they, they talk about how voter IDs are not f- fair to people of color, okay? 
all right, I'm I, I'm not a person of color. I mean, I'm Italian and Irish, but you know, I'm not a I'm not black. I'm not Hispanic. I don't fully understand the plights of what people like that have been up against. But voter IDs, I mean, I I, I don't know any black people that are unable to get IDs. I mean, if you don't have a driver's license, you can get a state issued ID. You can get an ID if you're a legal citizen of this country. And I don't understand how that's difficult. But the one thing I've seen is, especially in Boston, it seems like the black Americans and the Hispanic Americans have been the one that have a higher percentage of people that are not vaccinated. So now when you have these mandates in Boston and you're not allowing people into restaurants, you are basically segregating the population and in large amounts, not allowing black people and Hispanic people into your restaurants because they haven't been vaccinated. So how is this like, you know, I know that the new mayor and your administration want to have this new woke culture in Boston, but I mean, how does this work? I mean, how does that make any sense? where we are now preventing people of color from going into these restaurants. I mean, it's just, it just is crazy to me and it doesn't make any sense. And it just has no rhyme or reason. It seems like that these people that are making the decisions are just picking things out of thin air and you know, whatever. So let's see. Um, yeah. Right. Do you have to show an ID to get a vaccination? Right. I mean, that's a good question. I mean, for me, it, it was funny the other day. I where did I where was I? I went someplace, and I had to, I think I was buying beer or whatever I was buying. And again, you know, you've seen me, my friends on Twitter. You know, of course, I'm an incredibly handsome man. I know that it's it's a it's a cross that I have to bear, uh, despite having a small penis that I talk about quite a, quite a bit as well. And you know, I'm an incredibly handsome man. But again, I, I don't really look like I'm you know 19 years old anymore. I'm 54 years old. I'm old as fuck. I look like I'm old as fuck. I'm bald. I've got wrinkles. And I, someone asked me for my ID to buy beer. So for me, you know, here I am in Massachusetts. I mean, I think anyone with literally an IQ over 40 could take a look at me and realize that I'm not 20 years old. All right. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm just not. So they asked me for an ID for that. You have to get an ID to buy cigarettes. You have to have an ID to get married. You have to have an ID for your pets. You have to have an ID for basically everything. If you want to write a check in a store, nobody does that anymore. But if you still want to do that, you have to show an ID. Sometimes with credit cards, you have to show an ID. So an ID is a basic requirement, basically to do almost anything in life. But when we talk about one of the greatest, most important things that we have in this world, voting for president, voting for political office, voting for our leaders, you could just go in and claim whoever you, you, you want to be. And I, I've thought about that many, many times. I mean, I walk into my town. I live in a relatively small town. I think about 9,000 residents. And I walk in to vote. And when I vote, I walk in and there's a couple of old women there that generally I don't know. When I say old, you know, retirement ages, you know, probably mid 70s, maybe older. And they are volunteering for the voting. And all I have to do is give them my address. They look at the address. They see what voters are at that address. And they say, which one are you? I say, John DeVito. I mean, I could literally go in there and give any name, any address, because, I mean, you know the addresses in your town, and I could say that I'm anybody and get my vote across. I mean, how hard is it for me when I go up to that table to have my ID ready to pull that out and just say, yes, I'm John DeVito? It takes three seconds to show someone an actual ID, and that three-second effort makes sure that we have fair elections and I, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just so crazy. There's so many crazy things that, that are happening in this country. So I appreciate everyone that's coming in. You know, we're at 48 minutes. I'm going to keep the show in about an hour. I believe, uh, Eric, you said Michael's coming on at uh, 1 o'clock. So at the top of the hour, yeah. Show. yeah. So, I mean, what do you think about some of these things I'm talking about, Eric? I mean, does, does, does any of this make any well, sense to you, or is it just obviously crazy to you as well? Well, um, I, I think you really are hitting some, some things like right on the head. I know, like, I know that we, we get that these are going to be like very touchy I issues that, that people don't seem to want to talk about because I guess for them, it's just taboo. And, um, but I know like on the abortion issue, like the only, the only time I believe abortion should be permitted is in cases of rape, incest and the life of the mother or baby. Um, and I'm, and I'm not really supportive of taxpayer money, you know, no f f funding abortions, like in, in entities like, like Planned Parenthood, you know, and, and I think for like the last shoot 12 years, um, after listening to Jay Sekulow's radio show, there was one caller I agreed with that thinks instead of sending money to Planned Parenthood that, that taxpayers like us have to pay for, why not use that money instead to bail out social security and Medicare, you know, for, for people who really 
needed at a certain point in their lives. Let me, let me talk about that really quickly. Let me jump in on that because that, that is kind of become a hot button issue for me now where Eric, I know that, you know, you have autism and you've got a few challenges that make it difficult for you to work and you get some social security to help you. Now I am a fiscal conservative. Mm -hmm. However, you are the person or the type of person that I want to get my tax dollars to help. You deserve the help. My son, Matt is 18 years old or 19 years old now. And he's on the autism spectrum. He's got Tourette's syndrome. He's got ADHD, OCD. Things are hard for him. However, he is able to work at the local grocery store. So he's making a decent amount of money. You know, he makes maybe 300 bucks a week. But the bottom line is to live here in Massachusetts, rents at a minimum are like $2,000 a month, even for like a one bedroom. I, I saw that Boston has the one of the highest one bedroom apartment rates in the country at $2,700 a month for a one bedroom apartment. Massachusetts is a very, very expensive place to live for the people that don't live here. I mean, it's like California. It's very expensive. California, even more so than Massachusetts. But uh, Mass is very expensive. But, but you know what Social Security does? Social Security has been fighting with us tooth and nail. We got our son payments and he gets, I think it's maybe... 350 bucks a month. And now they're requiring us to send in his pay stubs. And if we don't send in his pay stubs, they will cut off the money he gets. I mean, $350 is barely even enough to provide food for one person living in this state with these new Joe Biden adjusted expensive prices. Social Security. I mean, again, we've got so many people out there, illegal immigrants. We've got so many people that are living off the system that are spending, we're spending all this money on. But then when you have people like Eric, when you have people like my son, when you have people like, say, a mother of three that doesn't have a husband that's trying to get her college degree that maybe got laid off, get that woman back on her feet. Help her. Give her money. I don't mind my tax money going for those people. For the people that are out on the streets, I walk around Worcester, Massachusetts, and I see people living under cardboard boxes. Pull those people out. Get them the mental health they need and help them get back on their feet. Don't give it to some guy that's living in the inner inner city that's mastered ripping off the system that has probably an under the table job where he's not getting paid taxes. He's collecting unemployment and selling drugs on the side and driving a Mercedes Benz to the grocery store to use food stamps to buy his meals. I mean, for crying out loud. So I, I see my son who is struggling and you know, when we're gone, God knows if he's going to have the money to support himself unless we set him up with some money. I mean, Social Security sticking it to them every chance they get. Now, Eric, have you had that same experience? Do you have to constantly fight with Social Security to keep your money, or is that just something they're doing to my son? I mean, I've not had any kind of experience um, where they where they want to hassle me, but I know, like five years, five six years ago, I got like a an SSI review letter in the mail, and and the, it's like um, whenever they would review my case, it's like. It, they would probably go 10 or 12 years at a time, which um, if you think, um, because I don't know if they, they're reviewing your son more frequently than they're reviewing me or, and I know like Dina Joe's got a son with autism and right. I know he has a part-time job. I don't know whether Dina Joe has had any kind of experiences similar to yours. It's been awful. I mean, it's constant. Like my, my wife handles this. And she, she's on the phone with these people constantly and they keep raising his money. Then they cut it. And then they say they paid him too much and they take it away. And now we have to send all of his pay stubs into them constantly. I mean, you know, the, the one thing I think about is, you know, I love my son to pieces, but could he do this without my wife and I here? I mean, luckily we're here to help him. I don't think he could manage this on his own. So if these things eventually are going to be coming directly to him, all of a sudden his payments are just going to stop and he's not going to be able to afford it. And, you know, I, I'm not someone, I'm not this like this cold hearted Republican conservative, you know, no one needs help. You know, this is a capitalist society. I mean, I, I do believe in capitalism. I do believe that in this country, we do have the ability to make something of your life. You know, if you, if you really work hard enough, but that is not possible for everyone. I mean, I, I think that some people need help. 
Some people have challenges, and I do 100% support my going, my money going to people that have mental issues, mental problems, that have physical issues, that have challenges that don't allow them to work and don't allow them. I mean, we got Ziller that comes in here, and he's got the seizure disorder where he has, you know, 30, 40 seizures during the course of a day. The guy can't work. Give them the help that he needs so we can have a life. You know, I mean, it, it, it's just crazy to me that, you know, these things happen. So anyway, you know, you, you kind of got me on the social security tangent, but I mean, it's really been bothering me lately. And I'm so frustrated to the point where, you know, I've even thought about, do we just get a lawyer and go after them and, you know, spend some money to let them know that we mean business. But then, you know, I also think about this and you'll get, maybe you guys can tell me, you know, my wife and I make a good living. You know, she's in the medical field. I'm in business and we do well and we don't hurt for money, which we're very fortunate with. And we, we feel very grateful that we don't. But I mean, am I being greedy? Am I being greedy asking for money from our government? I mean, we've always paid into it. it it's not for me. The money's for my son. You know, am I making, I don't know, am I, am I making a mistake in asking for that? Should, should we not be asking the government to help my son? Should it be something that we should be doing on our own? Maybe, maybe, maybe we're wrong. You know, I, I've thought about that quite a bit, so I'm not exactly sure, you know. What so, hey, listen, we, we got a couple minutes left. Now, Eric, I don't know if you're a football fan. Who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? Any guesses? Bengals or Rams? Um, I think this is a tough one to pick, but I'm sure our friend Mr. A wants to see his Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> and I'm sure even our California friends, yeah, like Solid Blue, Lady Me, and Rams. Poetic and Saucy, want to want to see um, the Rams win. Well, you know, I like the Rams. I mean, and I, I'm going to give you my feeling. I like the Rams. I use, I had uh, Cooper Cup a lot of my uh, fantasy team this year. I play in a league through DraftKings, and um, he's a great player. They're a great team. But for me, I do have a soft spot for the team that's never won a championship. Now, I don't know, has the Rams ever won a championship? I don't even know if they have an opt. I know the Bengals have not. So quite frankly, I'm kind of happy to see two teams in there that – you know, have not um, had a lot of success in the NFL. It's better than having, okay, so they both have. Okay, so they both have before. Both teams have won a Super Bowl before. But they're not teams like the Cowboys or the Steelers or the Patriots. So to me, it's good to see two new teams, some new blood. Hopefully it's a good game. I'm going to go with my pick now. Even though I think the Rams have a better team, I am going to go with the Bengals. I think the Bengals might win this one. So let's see if Look the Bengals at Mr. Win, a friend of mine will win. Is that $42,000? Nice. Holy shit. So what did they bet before the season, like for the Bengals to win the Super Bowl? Oh, my God. So you're going with the Rams. All right. I see Hasselhoff is in. Welcome to the show, Hasselhoff. Good to see you. But uh, we'll see. I mean, I, it should be a good game. I'll probably watch. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens with the Patriots. Now, did, did you guys see? Oh, now, wait a minute now. Um, slightly, since you're still here, my guy friends are planning something. Uh, for next fall, maybe you'd like to join us. Next fall, the Patriots are playing in Las Vegas, and we are planning a guys trip out with some of my guy friends to come out and see the Patriots play against the Rams in Vegas. Or not, not the not the Rams. Uh, who, what the hell? The uh, Raiders in Vegas. So if you want to come with us, I would love to have you come. So I'm going to be in Vegas next fall. We're already talking about the plans right now. We don't know where we're staying yet or any of that type of thing, but we got to meet up. So, you know, if you want to come to the game with us, the good, the good news is my buddy Mike is the morning drive sportscaster in Denver, and he has access usually to some pretty good tickets. We may even get sideline passes, so that might be kind of fun. So if you want to come along, you can bring your significant other and whoever, and we'll get out and have a good time. So we'll, we'll touch base as we get closer to that. Now, Eric, I want to ask you, before we go to some of the other shows coming up today, have you guys had any more meetings about having the uh, podcasters convention out in Vegas? Because I'd like to attend that also. Um. I know our next Zoom call with like Shannon and Pook will be on Thursday, but I don't have an exact time of day for it. But but I'll certainly see to it that you get an invitation. But I'm certain that Solid Blue Sister and John Gale, and I'm thinking maybe Dina Joe and Mike Tampa Bay might show up for that call. Um, and and maybe a couple other interested now, friends. Let, let me ask you a question now, and I say this. I want to say this with. Um, uh -huh. I guess in a politically correct way. Now, if there are people out there that maybe can't afford the funds of coming to Vegas, is there a way we could put together some type of fund to maybe help some of the friends that might struggle a little bit more financially so we could get them assistance to come out? Because it would be nice. I mean, if there was a podcaster out there that wanted to come that maybe couldn't afford – to go to Vegas and pay for the tickets and the flight and all that stuff. I mean, do you think we could come up with like a, a like a GoFundMe or something to that effect to maybe help I, some people that could use some help? 
I, I would think that would be doable, like ha- having like a GoFundMe account set up to, to make something mm. happen for somebody. That'd be good. And, like, I, perhaps maybe our friend, like our friend Robert. I mean, if he wants right. to come. Like, right. How is Robert? I haven't seen him in a long time. Is he still on or is he off Podbean altogether now? I mean, I, I still see him on Podbean every now and again. Um, He does his Camp Friendship show. Um, Yo, and I still see him see him come around to like a lot of the other podcasts like Mike Tampa Bay and, and he was at Michael Key show last night, but didn't get to call in on that one. Okay. Well, you know, I, I'd be interested. So if that does happen, make sure you let me know. Cause I would certainly, you know, do my part and help if I could help some people maybe come that, you know, maybe can't, can't swing it. So let's see, uh, DOS, the LOA, the Vegas podcaster convention guaranteed John wears in a Hawaiian shirt. Now I don't own a Hawaiian shirt, but I will wear a Hawaiian shirt just for you. DOS. Now, if you come DOS, I know I'd like to see you come, but you have to wear your Bernie Sanders mittens being that you're from Vermont. So I want to see you at that. <laughs> Good. Look at that. There we go. Slightly serious is showing up nude for you, Doss. No, I'll do that. I'll go with the nude. Again, keep in mind, though, if, if I show up nude, you'll probably have few people vomiting on the strip and things like that. It's not a pretty sight anymore. I don't know, but I, I, I will I will do my part and show up nude if, if that's what the thing Or y'all would probably have to go to one of the brothels in Nevada for that. <laughs> oh, man. Brothels. You know, the dude, for me, I, I've been married for 20 years. And uh, I, I don't want brothels, man. I want to just f- some fucking peace and quiet away from my family. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. I'll pass on the brothels, but I'll uh, do some of the other fun stuff that we all do, man. I don't need that shit. I've had enough sex in my life. I'm done. I'm, I'm fucking old now. I don't need any more of that shit. <laughs> I'm not paying to come home with crabs at my age. No, thank you. All right, Eric, why, why don't you? Hey, it was a pleasure to have you on, buddy. Why don't you read off some of the shows that are coming up and then we'll wrap up this bad boy and uh, move on. Uh-huh. And for, for, before I forget, Make sure all of you, if you haven't checked out Ralph Williams' new uh, site, WESN, Epic Strategy Network, you can actually download it on the App Store. I am one of the shows that's on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You can catch my show at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Generally, it's just a replay of one of the shows I've done during the week. But you've got a lot of good podcasters on there. And Ralph's a great guy. So make sure if you get a chance, you can either listen on the website directly at WESN.com or download the app and listen to your phone. And he, if you go into the website, there's like a list of all the shows, a whole schedule that tells you who's on, you know, like the gray area, the old man show, John Gale's now on. So there's a lot of good shows. And I'm, I'm hoping this uh, really takes off for Ralph because he's a great guy. So support I Ralph, so you know, download that app and check it out if you get a chance. So go ahead, Eric. Well, coming up on Podbean Latte, um, Michael Key's Real Conservative Talk podcast will be going live in about five minutes so be on lookout for that um yeah, check him out if you have he, he does, he's a young guy but he does yeah. a good job so check him out um and then coming up at 2 p.m um jeff moore will be doing a s- simulcast of his more money podcast um then the only crazy lady's doing her tuesday tarot card reading at 3 p.m eastern solid blue she should be check on that at 4 out. PM i want to check out crazy lady show I've, i haven't been on that i keep missing it. i gotta check that out and then John Gale, he'll be live at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then in prime time tonight, you've got um, Chuck and Billy's not your cup of tea. So the, you, you could be looking for them every Tuesday on Podbean now. Um, of course, tomorrow you've got Ralph in the morning as well as the Old Man's Podcast with Dina, Joe, and Eric. And, and I know you might decide to pop up again tomorrow sometime. Um, you've also got the yeah, Brady Show. Tomorrow. And- Tomorrow I have I have a work thing at like eleven twenty. So if I pop up tomorrow, it would probably be in the afternoon tomorrow. So I might do maybe something, yeah. you know, one, two o'clock, sometime around there if I can. So Well well, and I know you don't want to encroach on Frankie D though. Exactly. Luckily. I don't I, I want to avoid being on when somebody else is on. So maybe I'll do early in the morning. I'll figure it out if I can work out a time. Maybe I'll do yeah. before the old man show if I can. So we'll see. Uh huh. And then uh- and then Shannon Lynn's going to be doing her, doing her show tomorrow night at 11 p.m. Eastern. Um, um, ho- See, boss, hopefully, you know, Eric. Every time Eric uh, promotes a show, Michael Vick adopts a puppy. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. <laughs> um, well, and then you you've also got a, a couple of other friends who who are still still white, but hopefully that those friends like slightly serious and the Beans Winnie show come back very soon and. And then probably with the weekend coming up, you've got This Swap Doesn't Lie, and you've also got, um, you know, the dude Sean in the It's Doomsday podcast over the weekend. And then you've also got Slack Ready 2 um, tomorrow evening at 7. So be, definitely be on lookout for them. And, you know, the gray area, like Tampa Bay, the Unsupervised podcast, um, whenever they start doing new shows. And um, 
and, and a host of other great podcast fr- friends that I we may have missed, and you know, and you know, just you know, look, look forward to us doing this again soon. Absolutely. So everybody that came in, I really appreciate you all coming in. If this is the first time in, I hope you come back. If you could, please follow my show. Please share my live. And, uh, you know, I'm looking also, you know, probably Eric, maybe next week or the week after I'll go back and do some more interviews. So if anybody else wants to be Uh interviewed, you know, feel free to reach out to people or reach out to Eric or myself if you'd like to come on and be interviewed. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be a podcaster. You, You know who I'd like to interview? Honestly, I'm not sure if she's still here or not. But I'd like to interview Just Duck. I'd like to get her on the air because oh, yeah. she's been coming into my show forever. And I'd like to get her on and interview her if she's willing. So if not, no worries. I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable. Well, but, uh, if um, any of you want to come we, on, we'd we love to like to do, um, We still like to do Get to Know Your Podcaster interviews with Saul Boo's sister and yes. Percival Mann, yep. as well as like Jimmy. Of course, you know, you've you've known him since his Den of the Unknown days. Right, right. And, um, and we'll even we'll even yeah, allow no. Democrats on. So if you're a Democrat, I mean, it might you know, I might be rolling my eyes here by my podcasting stuff, but we, we will allow you, even if you're a Democrat. So I'll, I'll put that out there. Oh yeah. And we still need to get Sarge from the green area. And Ralph just duck smiled. And, and, Jack, and just duck. Is that a yes? Would you come on for an interview? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if so, I'd love to interview you and have you on the air. You've been that little friendly name and face that's come in forever. And uh, if you want to come in, just let us know. I'd love to schedule one and have you on. All right. So you don't have to, you don't have to right, make a decision uh, now. Just Michael think about just it. Now. All right. Yeah. Think about it. That works for me. And again, we'll, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. It'll be nothing personal, none of that stuff. We'll just kind of keep it light. But I'd love to hear your voice and get you on if you feel like you're up to it. So if not, no worries whatsoever. We love you. So, all right, everyone. Hey, take care. Have a great day. And uh, well, I get to go back to work, unfortunately. So hopefully everyone does well. And I'll probably be back, back on tomorrow. I'm not sure what time yet. But look for me doing a pop-up. All right, Eric. Hey, thanks for your help, buddy. Take care, everyone. Love you now. See you later. Bye-bye. Turn up the volume, Boomer. There we go. Boomer John, forget to turn up the volume as always. Love you all. Take care now.